Hi, my name is Christina Dar. I am the Imports Team Lead of the Import-Export Compliance Branch in the Office of Drug Security Integrity and Response within the Office of Compliance and the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. In this presentation, I will provide a fresh look of human drug importation requirements, clarify the requirements that apply to different drug types and discuss the routes of importation and the importation pathways that apply to human drug products. To get us started, I've included an organizational chart of the Office of Drug Security, Integrity and Response, otherwise known as OTSER, to show you where the import Export Compliance Branch lives, and to also give you a sense of the different components that make up the office. This will become more relevant as we uh, go through the presentation, um, particularly because I will be uh, discussing the mission of, of OTSER and how the Import Export Compliance Branch carries out this mission uh, by verifying the uh, import requirements of the products that are imported um, at the time of importation. I like to frame this presentation in the context of the FDA mission. In other words, the why of what we do. FDA is responsible for protecting the public health. And OATSER upholds this responsibility by protecting the integrity of the global supply chain throughout the drug life cycle to minimize consumer exposure to unsafe, ineffective, and poor quality drugs. And you'll see that these three key terms will be a common thread throughout the presentation. The CDR OC Imports Program carries out FDA's mission as well as OTSER's mission by ensuring that imported drugs meet the FDA standards for quality, safety, and effectiveness. We accomplish this by reviewing shipments of imported drugs before they, enter to the, before they enter the US. And in the review, we do an admissibility assessment, which verifies if the imported drugs meet the standards that may apply to that particular drug. And there could be two outcomes from this admissibility assessment. One is that the drug meets the FDA standards that are applicable, or that when examining the drug, we determine that it is it appears to be in violation of a section of the act. And, and later on in the presentation, I'll cover what those different types of violations could be. I'd like to end this section of the, the, the big picture and, and the, the why of what we do by providing you with a tangible example of an incident that FDA recently responded to in collaboration with the Custom and Border Protection Agency. And June of 2020, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, FDA identified uh, with the help of CPP that hand sanitizers that contain methanol were being imported into the U.S. As many of you may know, and perhaps know by now, if you didn't, hand sanitizers are considered over-the-counter drugs. And Methanol is a toxic substance. 
FDA implemented swift measures to mitigate the importation of these hazards, hand sanitizers, to protect the public health and prevent these hand sanitizers from being from from reaching Americans and and prevent injury. In this next section, I will cover FDA's regulatory purview in the context of drugs, and I will also discuss the import regulatory authorities that we draw on for uh, and that set the framework for the CDR OC imports program. So I'm going to take you back to the very basics of defining what is a drug. So some key terms um, that I think are important to highlight in the definition and that those are the articles, the articles intended for use in the treatment or prevention of disease are considered to be drugs. Articles intended to affect the structure or any function of the body of man are considered drugs, and articles intended for use as a component of a drug, in other words, active pharmaceutical ingredients, are considered drugs. So where does FDA draw its import authorities? Um, Section 801A of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act promulgates that the introduction or delivery for introduction of a misbranded, adulterated, and unapproved new drug is prohibited. And it also states that under this section, under Section 801A, an article, in other words, a drug in this case, is subject to refusal if it appears from examination and I think here the he are, appears an examination that the drug is has been manufactured, processed, or packed under unsanitary conditions, is forbidden or restricted for sale in the country in which it was produced or exported from, and is determine or it appears that the drug is adulterated, misbranded, or in violation of Section 505 of the Act. So, 801A is used in tandem with other sections of the Act. So, if at the time of importation, FDA determines that the drug is adulterated due to CGMP issues, then the drug may be detained and ref subsequently refused. Similarly, if it's determined that the drug is misbranded per Section 502 of the FDNC Act due to um, a lack of adequate directions for use or lack of registration and listing, registration of the manufacturer or listing of the drug, then the drug may be detained and subsequently refused. Or if it's determined that the drug requires a new drug, it's considered a new drug without an application, then it would also be, it may also be detained and subsequently refused. Okay, so now we've reached the point where we're going to talk in more granularity about the drug importation requirements. So first of all, there are many different types of drugs. Um, as you can see, we have prescription and generic medicine, investigation-only drugs, active pharmaceutical ingredients, API is also known as bulk drug substances. We have over-the-counter drugs, also known as 
non-prescription medicine. And there are biologics license application that are regulated by, by CEDAR. At the time of importation, FDA will verify compliance with the following requirements as applicable. We will verify that the foreign manufacturer is registered and that the product that is being imported is listed. We will verify, if applicable, that the new drug application, abbreviated new drug application, or biologics license application number is provided. And if the drug is being imported under an investigation on a drug that the IND number is provided. From a systems perspective, the, these are the three most common data elements that, that we would verify against our databases. However, we will also conduct field examinations to verify that the applicable labeling requirements for the product that is being imported are met. One point that I like to highlight is that even before an importer looks to import a drug, that it would be, it, it is advisable to check that that drug or that the manufacturer of that drug are not on import alert. And what I mean by that is that if the product that is being imported and the, or the manufacturer of that product are on, or on any import alert, um, the product would be detained without physical examination. And let me drill down a bit more on what an import alert is. So an import alert is an enforcement tool that the FDA utilizes to detain without physical examination products or manufacturers of drug products that are in violation or have been found to be in violation with a section of the act. So an example would be if the FDA conducted an inspection or has evidence that a firm is not manufacturing a product within, um, in accordance to the CGMP requirements, then that product may be placed on import alert 6640. And if you are an importer, Removing the manufacturer from this import alert, from import alert 6640, may be out of your hands. And so this is why it, it is advisable that you check that the product and manufacturer of that product are not on an FDA import alert. Okay, so now that we know that registration and listing is one data element that FDA verifies against um, at the time of importation, let's learn a little bit more about the registration and listing requirements. So foreign establishments that manufacture, repack, relabel, or salvage drug products for importation to the U.S. are required to register with FDA per uh, 501I of the Act list all of their commercially distributed drug products with FDA per, per 510J of the Act. And this is a new piece of information here. Foreign establishments requ required to register with the FDA must also list all known importers in their registration. And this is important uh, because it's in line with what I mentioned in the earlier slide where, where I stated that if there is a mismatch in the information that has been 
submitted to us, um, then a, an entry may be detained and flagged for further review by our compli uh, field compliance office to determine why there was a mismatch. So if we see an example would be that if we, if a, we see an importer uh, declared that it does not match our databases, we may detain that entry. Okay, moving on to drug label requirements. All drugs offered for importation into US, to the U.S. are subject to labeling requirements. General labeling requirements are found in 21 CFR 201.1 through 201.328. I won't go through this section of the CFR because it's an extensive one, but I do encourage you to become familiar with the requirements that would be applicable to the drug that you would be looking to import. Um, here I've highlighted some points uh, that I think are pertinent given that the drugs are would be that are being imported are would be from foreign manufacturers. So um, a product labeling should bear all required information in English. If a product labeling includes a language other than English, it should contain all required information in both languages. There is an exception, and that exception is if the drug is being imported to be distributed in the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, it is authorized to be to have the label in Spanish per 21 CFR 201.15 C. If the drug that you are importing is a prescription drug, it is required to include the RX only symbol on its label. Okay, continuing with drug label requirements. Here I've included the OTC drug facts label and this label is modeled after the Nutrition Facts Food Label. Um, this label is intended to be easy to use and read by the end user so that they can easily find the facts of the drug. So some uh, key facts that are included include specific warnings such as that keep out of reach of children, um, inactive ingredients. Um, the inactive ingredients are um, significant in that the uh, end user of the drug uh, may have allergies to specific inactive ingredients and by knowing what inactive ingredients are, are part of the drug formulation, they can advert potential allergies. And active ingredients, including the amount in each dosage unit. So make sure when you import a drug, an OTC drug, that that drug follows the, um, this format and it includes the information um, listed here. When we went over the definition of a drug, I mentioned that active pharmaceutical ingredients are also considered to be drugs. And therefore, APIs have to be declared to FDA. The same importation requirements apply to APIs, such as registration and listing, and the need to meet uh, applicable labeling requirements for 21 CFR 201.122. And uh, a key point to uh, remember from this slide is that APIs are also subject to the Finnish, the NDA, ANDA, BLA for the Finnish drug product where uh, in which the API is used. So 
the information, the NDA, ANDA, BLA application that applies to the API that is being imported should be submitted at the time of importation. You may be wondering how FDA verifies compliance of the importation requirements that apply to a drug that is being imported at the system level. And we rely on two elements. One are the affirmation of compliance codes and intended use codes. So first let's talk about AOCs. AOCs are three letter codes that can be provided at the time of import to demonstrate compliance of the imported drug to the FDA requirements and can also facilitate the review process. There are scenarios that have mandatory AOCs and there are other scenarios that don't include mandatory AFCs, but may have voluntary AFCs because there would be the added benefit of an expedited initial screening and review if those AFCs are provided. And where are these AFCs submitted? They are submitted through the automated commercial environment, which is a platform that is managed by CBP. So when you are working with your filer to declare uh, the drug that you're looking to import, make sure to be very familiar with what these AOCs are. Uh, first, what the requirements are that apply to your drug, to the drug that you're looking to import, and the AOCs that go along with that. I have included uh, here a list of affirmation of compliance codes, um, uh, but I do want to caveat it with saying that this is not an all-inclusive list. I do want to highlight the affirmation of compliance that are most common, such as DA. We have DLS, which is drug listing number. We have REG, which stands for drug registration number, and also IND, which is, um, stands for investigation on the drug number. Um, also, you see here that there are other AOCs that may be applicable to drugs for example, if you're importing a combination drug product that is uh, that has a device, you may have to include the uh, device listing number. But again, the most common ones that you you'll see are uh, DA, DLS, REG, and IND. I mentioned that there were two elements that the FDA relies on at a system level to verify compliance of imported drugs uh, with the importation requirements. Um, AOCs are one element and intended use codes are the second element. And the purpose of intended use codes are to allow the agency to know the purpose of the shipments coming into the country. So an example of that would be, so let's say you are importing an active pharmaceutical ingredient or an API. There could be multiple reasons for why you may import an API into the US. One example could be that the API is being imported for to be processed into a pharmaceutical product. If that is the case, you would choose the intended use code that applies to that scenario. So that could, would be intended use code 150.007. One, uh, and that scenario 
would would list um, or that IUC would list um, what type of AFCs apply to it. So the a man mandatory AFCs that would apply would be the registration and listing, REG, and the drug listing number, DLS. And if you recall, we also said that you may need to provide the drug application number that applies to the finished drug product in which that API will be used. So in addition to the mandatory AFCs of registration and listing, you may also have to include what we're calling a conditional AFC, which would be for the application DA. Okay, so another example of an IUC uh, following the same the same the same type of drug that would be imported such, such as um, an, an API. So if you, you're importing an API, you could also import it for uh, pharma pharmacy compounding. So that will have a different IUC number. So that would that would be one five zero point zero one three, and the AOCs that you would need to include are. DLS and REG, which are stand for registration and listing. There won't be a conditional uh, AFC for the drug application in this in this um, IUC scenario. Okay, so the next section will cover the routes of drug importation, also known as importation pathways. There are many different types of uh, routes of importation, and I am going to cover um, some of the most common ones that we see are used, um, starting off with U.S. good return. So in this type of uh, route of importation, a product can be returned to the U.S., but uh, for prescription drugs, it can only be re-imported into the U.S. by the original manufacturer. Um, examples of when this route of importation may be used are for recalled products, overstocks, and returns. Another route of importation is the import for export, uh, which is promulgated in uh, 801D3 of the Act. In this, in this scenario, an unapproved, an unapproved, so let's underline this, an unapproved or otherwise uh, drug that doesn't comply with FDA laws and regulations can be imported into the U.S. for further processing or to be incorporated into a product for export and ultimately export out of the U.S. Okay. Another route of importation is the personal importation policy. Um, PIP covers importation of a product that is not for further sale or distribution in the U into U.S. commerce. Um, I am going to cover, uh, go over the criteria that applies to personal importation, the personal importation policy, but I also do um, advise that the that you familiarize yourself with sub uh, chapter nine two of the regulatory procedures manual. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with the RPM, and if you're not, I suggest that you do become familiar with it. So the FDA uh, may not object to uh, the importation um, of a drug product under PIB if the product is not for treatment of a serious condition and there's no known significant health risk. 
So this applies, this particular point applies primarily to over-the-counter drugs. Or, here's a big or, or the product is for the treatment of a serious condition. And this applies to prescription drug products. Everything else that I'm going to cover, uh, all the other uh, criteria that I am going to cover applies to prescription drug products. So if you're importing a prescription drug product, FDA may not object to the importation of a drug under the PIP uh, policy if the product is for a serious condition for which effective treatment may not be available domestically, either through commercial or clinical means. Again, uh, I highlight clinical means. There is no known commercialization or promotion of the product to pers persons residing in the U.S. The product does not represent an unreasonable risk. The consumer affirms in writing that the product is for personal use. And the quantity is generally not more than a three month supply. Okay, and then this criteria, criteria here has another subset of requirements which states that the um, name and address of the doctor licensed in the US responsible for the treatment of the patient looking to import the product should be provided, or evidence should be provided that the product is for the continuation of a treatment begun in a foreign country. So an example of when PIP would be used and would be allowed is when foreign nationals visit the U.S. In the, this slide and the next slide, I'm going to talk about uh, two scenarios, and also this is a, a another route of importation, but uh, two scenarios are the, they're slightly different, um, and and I, I I will be making the distinction because we have uh, received many inquiries uh, in instances when a drug is being imported for non-clinical uh, research and development um, that have been sometimes detained for further review uh, because information uh, may be missing or because it is not clear to us um, what the uh, what the drug is imported uh, being imported for. So just to be crystal clear, non-clinical uh, research and development importations are uh, referred to products that are not intended for use in humans. And I'm going to highlight that. This is very important. This, uh, these types of importations are exempt from registration and listing requirements. This is probably the one of the very few examples where registration and listing is not required. Also, the, uh, the quantity that is imported under um, these types of importation should be reasonable for the research to be performed. So if we see that there, is, uh, there are quantities that don't align for the purpose of the research or uh, if, if it, we, we see, um, you know, a discrepancy in, in the quantity, we may, we may detain to further determine um, why uh, such a large quantity is being imported. And as part of these types of importations, we suggest that a statement of intended use, which is different from the intended use codes that we discussed earlier on, be submitted um, at the time of importation. So what this means is that the statement of intended use will tell us uh, what the product is being imported um, uh, for. So 
Um, you could say that the product is being imported to conduct additional testing um, for uh, to, and to collect data to support an IND. That could be one example. But it's important to provide, uh, or it, it is helpful to provide a, the, a statement of intended use of the product. Okay. And I want to hone in again on the non-clinical research and development importation scenario because we have received a number of inquiries to our mailbox of entries that have been detained that ha have declared that are for non-clinical research and development, um, but, but also in uh, the documentation, it states that they that they are for non-clinical research and development and that they will also be used for human drugs. So just so that we're very clear, if you are importing a product for non-clinical non research and development, then it cannot be used in humans. But we do recognize that there are instances where the sponsor is looking to generate data in order to submit an IND. And so the FDA may consider not objecting to its import, to the importation of drugs for this purpose, if the following three uh, points are clear to us. One, we understand we have a description of the drug's intended use. Two, uh, we know uh, the specific research to be conducted with that drug. Um, we know uh, that the quantity uh, offered for import is reasonable uh, for that intended use uh, that, that, is, uh, that is to be uh, uh, conduct, uh, done for the intended use that it is intended for. And three, that the um, sponsor affirms that the drug will not be commercially distributed. In the last uh, route of importation that I am going to talk about is PLAIR. And PLAIR stands for Pre-Launch Activities Importation Requests. PLAIRs allow Certain in certain circumstances, product sponsors anticipating, I think it's important to highlight this too, anticipating approval of a drug application, which includes an NDA, ANDA, or a BLA to import unapproved finished drug products. And I think the key here is also finished drug products in order to prepare for market launch. I highlight these two sections because players do not apply to um, APIs or bulk substances. They only apply to unapproved finished dosage form drugs. And um, you may be wondering what should be included as part of the player. Um, we have uh, information available on the FDA website on what needs to be submitted. It's um, a whole list of, um, of information, but at a high level, you ought to include the, the uh, drug product name, the name of the CEDAR Office of New Drug or Office of Gener Generic Drugs Project Manager assigned to the pending original application, the NDC code, if assigned, the name, address, registration number, and telephone number of the foreign manufacturer of the finished dosage form drug product, the name, address, registration number, and telephone number of the U.S. consignee, the application number for the finished dosage form drug product that is pending approval by FDA, the name, address, registration number, and telephone number of the warehouse or the distribution facility controlled by or under contract with the applicant where the finished dosage form drug product um, will be um, in its pa final package form um, uh, will be stored pending the approval of the application. And um, 
and I, I think that that pretty much covers the the big the big uh, uh, elements of of uh, the of the request that uh, that should be included in the request. Um, so these can be the these requests can be submitted to Cedar OC Player at fda.hhs.gov. Um, another point that it's important to note is that the amount of drug imported see, into the U.S. must match the amount in the original player submission. Otherwise, an amended player would have to be submitted to CEDAR um, it, to, to receive approval. Okay, so we've reached the end of the presentation and now um, I have uh, two challenge questions for you. So the first one is, which of the following statements is not true? So APIs are considered to be drugs. APIs have to be declared to the FDA. APIs do not have to comply with applicable requirements of the finished dosage drug product. And the APIs also have labeling requirements. Which one of uh, those is true? Oh, excuse me, is not true. Uh, is not true, is not true. Okay. The answer is C. APIs do not have to comply with applicable requirements of the finished dosage drug product. And here we have, let's see, do not. This is the key word here. Okay. The next challenge question is um, whether foreign establishments required to register with FDA must list X in their registration. So A is imported drugs only. B is imported drugs and known importers. C is imported drugs in all known importers, and D is all known importers only. Okay, the answer is C, imported drugs and all known importers. Okay, here I have included uh, a number of the resources that I used for um, the presentation and that I think would be uh, value add to your uh, knowledge bank um, as you navigate through the importation um, process of drugs. Okay, and to summarize um, what we've discussed, I think we, we the presentation covered a, a wide number of um, aspects starting with the uh, the why and the impact of our um, of the CEDAR OC import imports program. Uh, we discussed uh, the uh, regulatory purviews that afford us the authorities to uh, take out the uh, in, uh, actions that we take uh, in at the border. Um, 
we went over the importation requirements that apply, uh, the most common ones. We went over the, uh, a li uh, to a lesser um, depth, but we went over the elements that are, uh, we rely on from a systems perspective to verify compliance of, of an imported drug to the FDA requirements. We went over the different routes of importation. And um, so here I like to, again, summarize um, uh, some key points that FDA will verify compliance with applicable re requirements of a drug at the time of importation. I think that's crystal clear by now. Uh, before importing a product, ident identify whether it is a drug and learn the applicable requirements and become familiar with them. And the third uh, reminder is that if you are an importer, that you review the history of the foreign manufacturer to make sure it is not on import alert. I think that uh, those two things will uh, doing that will, 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 will save you um, uh, time and headaches. Okay, so thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you for uh, listening and um, uh, now it's time for questions. Thank you for that great presentation. This is Ray Ford back to help facilitate the question and answer session. If you haven't had a chance to submit your questions, please do so now using the Q&A chat pod. We do have a question, our first question. Are there any requirements for U.S. importers of a drug manufactured in a foreign facility? Does the U.S. importer need to be registered, a registered drug establishment? Hi, yes, uh, the U.S. agent, uh, so the requirements are this, the U.S. agent must be located in the U.S. Otherwise, uh, there are no other requirements for the U.S. For the US importer. Um, so there were the, and then the other one about uh, the U.S. importer needing to be a registered drug establishment. Um, if you are involved in a manufacturing, repackaging, relabeling of a drug, you would have to be registered. However, if you're only distributing uh, uh, the drug product in the U.S., you don't have to be uh, registered. Uh, but we do advise that you work with the foreign establishment to make sure that you are listed as a known importer in their registration. Thank you for responding to that question. Our next question is, if a supplemental ANDA as a CBE 30 or PAS is filed to propose changes to the approved drug product. What is the procedure to import the drug product while the supplement is under review by the FDA? So if there are different uh, processes or procedures that would apply for each, but in a nutshell, for finished drug products uh, like CBE 30, we recommend that you wait uh, 30 days before importing. And if you have submitted a, a PAS, uh, we recommend that you import after you receive approval. Thank you for responding to that question. Our next question. Are there any requirements for the U.S. importer of a drug manufactured in a foreign facility? Does the U.S. importer need to be registered as a drug establishment? Um, again, the if it's a, a U.S. importer that is not involved in the manufacturing of or processing of a drug product, 
um, and they're only distributing that drug, um, then they are not required to uh, uh, register with us. However, uh, we do uh, emphasize the importance of making sure that you work with your the foreign manufacturer um, to make sure that you are listed as an importer in their registration. Because if if um, you uh, you import a product and we don't see you um, in our databases as a listed importer, then uh, as part of the foreign manufacturer, then the, that product or that entry may be detained. Thank you for responding to that question. Our next question, is an ACE or ACE account absolutely necessary? It's, um, it is not, the, the word, I guess the key word here is absolutely. Um, I, I believe CBP, uh, the Customs and Border Protection Agency has some criteria that, uh, that may list some exemptions, and I, I suggest you check with CBP for that. Um, but as far as FDA is concerned, uh, you know, you, we do, um, if you have an ACE account, then that means that you're able to submit your entries electronically. And the benefit of that is that you, uh, you know, that, that it would expedite the review of your entry um, and so that would be a, a reason to uh, have an account. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question that we have, I have observed issues importing an investigational API for which the IND has not yet been filed because the DP for the first and man study will be made in the U.S. with this API. For example, upon reaching customs, we are asked to provide the IND number, which is not yet available. What is the best way to import an API in this situation? Sure. So, I think in my in the presentation, I, I try to hone in on this point because we we do recognize that we have that we do receive a, a, a high volume of questions around this subject. And what our stance is that, you know, FDA may not consider objecting to the importation of um, an API for which uh, the IND has not yet been filled as, as long as, um, um, uh, you know, as long as you provide a description of the drug's intended use, um, including the specific research uh, you, you plan to conduct, uh, you, provide, you provide the quantity offered for import. Um, you know, we check to see that the, you know, that the quantity aligns with uh, the intended uh, research use. And um, as long as you uh, also provide, um, you know, you know uh, again, uh, provide that in a, in a uh, statement of use. Um, the statement of use would help again help us with um, with uh, understanding what the purpose of of the importation is. Thank you for responding to that question. Our next question is: You stated that importers' information inclusion on foreign establishment registration is a new requirement. Can you advise when the, uh, that information became required? I had already thought that that was necessary. Um, and you are correct the, that this is not a new requirement. I think if I said new, I may have said it in the context of the new information that was being presented in that particular slide. Um, it is not a new requirement. It, it is a requirement that has been in place for quite some time. Um, the uh, but many many uh, we still see many um, entries being detained um, because uh, many oftentimes the we don't see the um, the importer's name listed in our databases and so um, I thought it was pertinent to highlight that point. Thank you for responding to that question. 
Our next question is the following. Are AOCs required for OTC hand sanitizer manufacturers that are overseas? Yes, AOCs uh, don't distinguish between a, an over-the-counter hand, uh, hand sanitizer manufacturer or um, a prescription manufacturer. The, the way the AOCs work is that they're, um, they're neutral. They're, they, um, they look at, uh, you know, as I described in the presentation, there are some that are mandatory that, you know, are, um, that would apply for, to uh, registration and listing requirements. So in this case, um, an OTC hand sanitizer manufacturer would be required to uh, be registered with FDA, um, and, and it may have other AOC and other requirements that um, would uh, uh, require AFCs. Thank you for responding to that question. Our next question is a two-part question. So if I'm importing a starting material, intermediate, impurity marker, et cetera, that is not an API, I need to provide an IUC so that the material isn't treated as an API? Where do I find the IUCs for these scenarios? And how should I provide this information to the party responsible for the importation? Sure. The, um, the the best thing would be to um, become familiar with what we call uh, with uh, what we call the su supplemental guide, and that is uh, something that you can find in the CBP website. But the FDA also has uh, really good resources uh, to this effect. Um, for example, we have a document that's called um, uh, Industry Quick Reference Guide to the FDA um, ACE supplemental guide, um, and in there you, uh, you will be able to uh, uh, find um, examples of when, you know, when to, when to use which IUCs and, um, uh, and for, you know, for different scenarios. So I, I, I highly recommend that, that you start with the FDA um, quick guide, and then uh, if you have additional questions and need more clarity to to look at the CBP supplemental guide, which is the full um, uh, reference document. Thank you for responding to that question. Our next question is a rather long one. Please identify the route of importation for a prescription human medicine that is manufactured in the USA, packaged in its primary packaging in the USA, exported to a foreign country in order to be secondary packaged in its final commercial form. For example, the primary packaged product is put in the commercial box with the insert leaflet received serialization. And then it's imported back in the USA for distribution and commercialization in the U.S. market. Sure. The a uh, route of importation that would apply to this scenario would be the U.S. goods returned um, route of importation. And it, again, the, I like to highlight that this only applies if the product is imported uh, back to the entity that is uh, responsible for uh, manufacturing it. And I suggest that you uh, visit um, import alert 6614. Um, that import alert uh, covers, um, uh, provides more details on um, why FDA may detain a product that is being declared um, as a U.S. goods returns, and I think that would provide you with more insights on on um, uh, whether, uh, you know, uh, your scenario uh, would be, uh, applies or not. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question is the following. Does import for export apply to transshipment of drugs throughout the United States?
Okay, so the import for export uh, policy or uh, route of importation um, does not uh, uh, apply to um, to transshipment of drugs. So what that means is that um, a finished drug cannot be imported to the U.S. under um, IFE uh, for storage and uh, subsequent exportation. Um, drugs most go through uh, further processing or packaging to qualify for IFE. Thank you for responding to that question. We have the next question. What happens after FDA has granted the player? So, um, so after the FDA has granted a player, the the sponsor or U.S. agent should provide the specific custom entry number under uh, which the drug is subject to the player um, will be imported um, to DIO. And there is a, a, um, a mailbox that you would submit this information to. So it's uh, dialplayer at fda.hhs.gov. So you would provide this entry information in advance of the shipment. And one thing to note is that that the we only use one import entry uh, for the player, so you wouldn't be able to submit multiple entries for the uh, for one player. Uh, so just be mindful of that when uh, when when importing a a drug product under um, a a player that has been granted. Thank you for responding to that question. Looks like we have time for just one more question. What are the requirements for convenience kits? Sure. So the requirements for convenience kits are that all drugs that are um, included in a convenience kit that may have uh, medical devices and, and or biologics um, are required to meet um, the uh, drug requirements in the same way as as if as if you were importing a uh, uh, only drugs in in that particular entry. Well, that's all the time we have for questions. A huge thank you to Lieutenant Commander Dar for the presentation and answering all the